Right, I'm very glad to be joined by Alex Carter, who is a professor of philosophy at the Institute of Continuing Education in Cambridge. Is that an <laughs> accurate reflection of your title? Uh, official title, Academic Director for Philosophy. Academic Director of Philosophy, yeah. okay. Fair enough. <laughs> and your, your sort of specialism is in Wittgenstein and the philosophy of sport and a number of other areas. Can you just sort of outline what your specialisms are and what your sort of research and teaching involves mostly? So my background is in Wittgenstein in particular. I studied at a school of Wittgenstein uh, studies, which is the University of Wales, Swansea, which is sadly no longer with us. Um, but at Swansea, uh, there's a, there was a focus on the philosophy of religion in particular. So Wittgenstein's philosophy of religion, which we might touch upon, uh, even in, con in connection with philosophy of sport, um, has this uh, difficult relationship with other philosophers areas of philosophy so philosophy of religion for Wittgenstein is about defending religion without being religious which is why you end up annoying both sides of the debate um, and essentially so I've got very used to being kind of a, an outsider in philosophy in fact we've had members of the faculty from the uh, University of Cambridge Faculty of Philosophy come here and say it's great that you're interested in Wittgenstein in ethics in Nietzsche in Simon Weil in the philosophy of sport because we're not Mm -hmm. uh, we're very much a logic and mathematics uh, faculty. We, that's always what we've been. That's always what we're going to be. Um, so it's great that you're interested in these outsider things. So it's interesting that we're sat here at Maddingley Hall, which is about four miles outside of Cambridge, doing kind of outsider philosophy. Mm -hmm. Which for me, though, is why people get interested in philosophy, though, questions about sports, questions about religion. These are the things that get people interested in philosophy in the first place. So it's quite fun to be able to play with those ideas. Mm. Let's jump straight into Wittgenstein then and his sort of philosophy of religion. What is the sort of outline of his perspective on religion and ethics and how does it differ from other philosophers, especially of his time? So Wittgenstein, uh, as you probably know, as, as, but some people may not be aware of, uh, is referred to as the early Wittgenstein and the later Wittgenstein. That can make you think that there's two people like the younger Pliny and the elder Pliny, but it's not. It's uh, he's uh, it's one philosopher. My personal view on Wittgenstein is that there is there are three Wittgensteins, but essentially the third one unites them. So ironically, I use a kind of religious metaphor here to say the Wittgenstein of the Tractatus, the early Wittgenstein, his early works are the sort of Old Testament Wittgenstein where you get sort of very hardline views on what reality is about. It's about truth, it's about correspondence to facts, it's about atomic facts, it's about propositions and logical truth, and about anything that's not about that, so religion, ethics, etc., we have to stop talking about. Mm. Then you get the later Wittgenstein who realised that we do more in language than just describe the world. We don't just say how many chairs there are in a room, we say, please take a seat, which is neither true nor false. Right, so the later Wittgenstein realised that language was a much richer kind of animal than the early Wittgenstein had given a credit for. But then there is this kind of third Wittgenstein, who I call the ethical Wittgenstein, which you might call the Holy Ghost, uh, who unites those two positions, which is the ethical Wittgenstein, which never really changed. The Wittgenstein who's talking about ethics and religion and fate and God in the notebooks which he was writing in the trenches in the First World War is the same Wittgenstein who's writing in a little hut in Norway in, you know, in, later in his life about things like culture and value and meaning. Um, but for Wittgenstein, religion and ethics are the things upon which we can't disagree. And the reason we can't disagree about things in religion and ethics is because we hold them without realizing we're holding them as beliefs. So to give an example very quickly, he says, if I look overhead, it's 1944, and I say, I think there's a German plane up there. And the person standing next to me says, I'm not so sure. Meaning, it might be a German plane, it might be a British plane, maybe it's not a plane, maybe it's a bird, and we're hearing a car in the distance, etc. We can disagree about those kinds of things. But if I was to say, one day we'll all be judged, meaning there is a last judgment, there will be a time when after we're dead, there will be a judgment of all of us, and someone says, I don't know, I'm not so sure, then we are worlds apart. There is no grounds upon which we can have a conversation about that particular thing. Mm. And the idea is that the, the beautiful analogy that Wittgenstein was so good at throwing up here was that, that of a river. That sort of the froth where we disagree, the, the fashions that change very quickly and the things we get most angry about actually probably in our lives, the little things. Uh, are the stuff on the surface, the water that's moving quickly. Below that is slightly slower moving current, which are perhaps more sort of semi-cultural norms, but not really cultural, they are still fashion. 
then as you go further down, you get a silt on the top of the, the riverbed and that's moving along with the water. So fashion's impacting upon that in some way. And those are the kind of the, the rules that maybe are law, perhaps law bends to cultural changes. We've seen this in the country at the moment going mm -hmm. on right now. Um, and then as you keep going down, you eventually get to a bedrock. Mm -hmm. And at that bedrock is just simply where explanations come to an end. So it, the reason we don't disagree about them is because I'm not holding those beliefs on the basis of an explanation which I can offer to you. I'm just holding those beliefs. And the point is, explanations would have to come to an end. Logically, we make sense of that idea, that explanations must ultimately come to an end. And it's there that we get the sort of moral, but also uh, sense of reality of our own world. To give another example, Wittgenstein says, if I put a pan of water on a stove, and I expect it to boil. I turn up the heat and, it, and it, you know, I expect it to get hotter, but instead of getting hotter, it gets colder and it freezes. In that situation, I would be bemused. I would be mind blown. I wouldn't know what was going on, but I would have a methodology. I would say, what were the variables? What can I, can I do it again? Can I do it with another pan of water? If I turn it up in the same way, would it have to do the same thing again? But if, for instance, I meet someone I've known for all my life and they're my best friend, and I don't believe that they are my best friend, that I suddenly believe that they're an automaton or some sort of, um, you know, some, some spy who's tricking me. Everything comes crashing down, he says. There is no recovery from that doubt. Mm. And it's interesting that, like Descartes, he's playing with this idea of doubt and how far can you push it, but he says that's how far you can push it. And that's interesting because Wittgenstein, because uh, Descartes starts with that doubt. He says, I look out the window and I see people walking about. Maybe they're automata. Wittgenstein would say, at that point, you've already lost me. <laughs> but the, interestingly, Wittgenstein also said about Descartes, how did he even start? Because he had to express these thoughts in either French or Latin, which means that he's willing to doubt the existence of people or reality or water, earth, fire, etc. He can doubt all the existence of things, his own body, he can doubt that. But he can't doubt the existence of the French language or Latin language and the history that that implies mm -hmm. because he's having the thoughts in those languages and he couldn't have the thought otherwise. Yeah. But isn't that the same as I think therefore I am effectively? It's a, the sort of just self-justification is what I see as circular reasoning, to be honest. That you're, you're trying to justify your own argument by the existence of your own argument, which I don't think is valid personally. But. Descartes' argument is, is flawed, absolutely. Yeah. Um, one of the things I do with my students when we're, we're talk, teaching Descartes, which we'll be doing in a few weeks, um, is I say to them, you are all Cartesians, probably, because you all believe you have a mind and a body. Um, but you're going to read Descartes now and probably think he's an idiot. You'll probably think his arguments are utterly flawed and we'll look at the fallacies and all the problems with his argument. But you're going to walk out of the door as a Cartesian still because mm. you're still going to believe you have a mind and a body. And that should worry you. That should cause you. So this is what philosophy on the outside is a little bit about. It's about making sure that people recognize that it's a problem, not for Descartes, but for you. Yeah. But Wittgenstein's response to that is quite telling in that he says, the one thing I can't really doubt is language. And along with language comes everything else. Mm. So I can't doubt anything, really, because if it's there to be understood in language, then it's there to exist. Yeah. Well, didn't he, just, uh, having read all of the uh, older philosophers that he used to look up to, having read them, realised they were all idiots or said that they were, he was the last philosopher and they were, they were all wrong and he was the one who was going to end philosophy, effectively? Wittgenstein had quite a lot of contempt for philosophers, yeah. So he <laughs> said, I don't read other philosophers because what they tend to do is induct you into your own, into their mistakes. Mm. They end up bringing you into their sort of... You can read Descartes and say, the rules of his game are perfectly intelligible rules and you can play that game. But the game doesn't get you to where you wanted to go because where you started was the real world. Mm. And where the rules have taken you is off to this weird, abstruse game which no one really should be playing at all. Certainly not sitting alone in a room, right? Um, and Wittgenstein also, uh, it, of the two philosophers that he had respect for, it was Schopenhauer and Kierkegaard, really, because he mm. asked his sister to send them to him in the trenches. So we know that he read those. He also read Otto Weninger, who had written about sexuality, and you can imagine why Wittgenstein might be interested in that, as, yeah. as what is recognised largely that he's likely to be a gay man. In fact, he had gay relationships in his life, so he would have been interested in the, sort of those kinds of questions. But the philosophy side, the sort of strict philosophy stuff, it was more the kind of existentialist philosophers that he was drawn to. Um, and of course, he had contempt for philosophers of his own time. G. E. Moore and Bertrand Russell did his viva, so when he was teaching at Cambridge, he had to get his... Uh, thesis passed, which he submitted his tractatus, which was already famous at that time. 
And G.E. Moore and Bertrand Russell quizzed him on this. And at the end, he patted them on the shoulder and said, don't worry, you'll never understand it. <laughs> well, there's something, there's something about sort of highly intelligent people, most of them, that they're often flawed in many ways. And Wittgenstein seems to be particularly flawed in his character and his narcissism and, and the degree to which he think, thought he was the be-all and end-all of life and the most yeah. intelligent person in the world. A deeply unpleasant man. Um, I mean, he had regrets about the bad things he did. So some of the worst things we know he did, like hitting a child, um, he, he had deep, profound regrets about. It. He burst into tears, apparently, to a friend uh, talking about the little girl that he hit once because as a teacher and someone who probably was on what we would now regard as the autistic spectrum, Wittgenstein was probably mm. you know that kind of, I don't understand why you don't understand this. Yeah. Which can be frustrating for teachers, but most teachers, hopefully, like myself, would just say, <laughs> that's fine. You know, it's all about a learning curve. Let's try and work with, with you to do this. Wittgenstein would have just said, I've got no time for you. If you're not a genius, there's no point in talking to you. Mm. So that's why he was probably drawn to Cambridge as well, where there's lots of these luminary figures going around and I can have intelligent conversations with them. Um, little conversations that you would have had about things like photography. So the, uh, the chap who invented uh, fingerprinting um, that was first used by the police uh, also invented a type of photography and Wittgenstein got fascinated by this, of course, because of his family resemblances, this idea that words get their meaning not through strict rules, but through just general family resemblances between ideas. He took that and made it literal by taking photos of an entire family, his own family, that he then combined through one print to create a picture of someone who never existed, but was an amalgam of all the people in the family. Mm. And so he, he liked playing with all those kinds of ideas. He wasn't very good as a teacher because he wouldn't have focused on research. He only published one thing in his lifetime, well, arguably two. Uh, a dictionary was the other one. Oh, did he do a dictionary as well? Yeah, so recently there's been some news about this. So he wrote a dictionary for his students in Austria. Right. Um, it was a German language dictionary, but it was kind of pushing you towards... Of course, language was his pre-key focus, so you could understand well, why he yeah. would do this. Well, of all words or just words relating to his works, his philosophical So works? I don't know too much about this particular work, yeah. but uh, it was the first thing he published aside from the Tractatus, or maybe it came out after the Tractatus, I'm not sure, but around the same time. But certainly from that time, from like 1919, early early 1920s, there was nothing then published up mm. until his death in 1951. And then it was only shortly after that that the philosophical investigations came out. Mm. Well, it seems to be a characteristic of, of philosophers who deal with the most fundamental nature of reality, that they have to set out so many definitions. I mean, Spinoza did this mm -hmm. in ethics, of course, to a ridiculous degree of having to define absolutely everything, which takes up almost the entire work in just setting out how you what you mean by certain words and then taking those through to the logical arguments. So Spinoza, just the perfect person to mention in connection with Wittgenstein, because he is kind of, he's not just the philosopher's philosopher. I mean, Deleuze called him the prince of philosophers and other people have you know, had this real praise for Spinoza. My praise for Spinoza comes generally from the fact that when you're teaching Descartes, you say he created all these problems, most of the problems of philosophy that Bertrand Russell talks about. So hundreds of years later, writing the, the problems of philosophy, how many of them were either inspired by, started by, or at least influenced by Descartes, you know, you kind of nine out of 10. Mm. Um, and yet Spinoza, 30 years after Descartes was writing, Spinoza comes along and solves all of Descartes' problems, <laughs> all of them. Well, no one notices. <laughs> and it's okay, so like, philosophy should have really ended with Spinoza. Yeah. <laughs> kind of, but it really, it, I mean, there's one way of understanding philosophy that it, it kind of came to an end with Wittgenstein. Certainly he thought he'd ended philosophy twice, mm. which is ironic, I suppose you could say, that he ends it first with a tractator saying, I've solved all the problems of philosophy, it's done now, it's done and dusted, there's no need to worry about this, there's no philosophical problems, there's ethical problems and linguistic problems and philosophers can maybe have some role to play in this but but philosophy is is done then realizing that language was more full than this going on to write the philosophical investigations and saying there is more that philosophy can do but it's essentially a kind of therapy that the problems that people have been getting into throughout history they're going to continue to get into and philosophers should be therapists trying to pull people back into the, the mm. sort of commonsensical view that's one view of Wittgenstein. But I, what I find interesting about the ethical Wittgenstein is that you get this kind of third side of that, which is not therapeutic. It is, well, it is therapeutic, but it's therapeutic in the sense that it's not something that's correcting a mistake. It's, it's pushing us to be more than we were, which yeah. is exactly what you see in Spinoza too. Yeah. Well, like you say, there's, a, there's almost the line of philosophy that tries to understand truth and reality. And there's the line of philosophy that tries to that ignores that side of it and says you should live this way 
knowing the amount that you do and not knowing all these other things but, but that doesn't matter but you should live this way for these reasons and they're almost i mean let's go into sort of the religious side of him so what, mm. what was wittgenstein's perspective on religion and how was how does his philosophy affect his perspective on religion so norman malcolm wrote this quite interesting book called uh, wittgenstein a religious point of view question mark and the reason for the question mark is because wittgenstein had this very difficult relationship with religion so he was a defender of religion, undeniably. He saw religious meaning as, as having this great significance. He was similar to Camus once Camus met Simone Weil. So Simone Weil, French uh, philosopher and theologian, some would argue a mystic. Uh, I'm mentioning her for a reason, and, but, but she um, met with Camus, Camus a famous atheist, and, and convinced him of the possibility of religion. And that's a big deal. I mean, I, I have deep respect for Camus for the fact that he was open-minded enough to recognise the possibility of religion, at least. And I think this is where lots of us philosophers are stuck, in the possibility of religion. Mm. And this is where Wittgenstein was stuck. So he went, allegedly, to a mediocre play. So unlike, he didn't have a Simon Weil, he had a mediocre play in Vienna, apparently, that he went to before he went off to the fight the First World War. And watching this play, he, he was... Uh, confronted with this uh, experience that a character was having, or that of feeling perfect safety. Now, not nothing, can, not the evangelical sense of if you're on God's side, he'll look after you. Much more like even if you get cancer, even if you get seriously ill, even if you end up in the trenches and you're fighting a horrible war, everything is fine. Even if the worst happens, everything is fine. And that, he said, was a uniquely religious experience. You cannot experience that outside of religion. Therefore, religion is a meaningful discourse. Mm. Therefore, it is something that will enrich someone's life if they go, if they have it as part of their life. But religious people can make mistakes, just like everyone else can make mistakes. And Wittgenstein also recognized that a lot of what passes as religion is actually superstition. So, for instance, to give you one sort of concrete example of how you might apply this today, you have people going up to people and saying, why do you pray? And someone will respond, because I want things to change. I want the world to be better. Now, they've already gone wrong, Wittgenstein would say. No, that's not why you're praying. If you think by praying you can change things, you're a fool. Because you will have seen thousands of times before that this hasn't worked. Now, I know there's been empirical studies to try and show the effect of prayer. The very fact that they do that implies that they don't know that it works. And certainly for the last few thousand years, they didn't know that it works. So maybe prayer can be used empirically, but then it just becomes like taking a pill, right? And mm. it ceases to be religious. It becomes causal. So it's either science or it's superstition. One thing it's not is religious. The religious expression of prayer is simply expressing grief or sorrow or pity. Right. So if you said, why are you praying? The correct answer you might want to give is no reason. I, what, you might as well ask why, I'm, why I cry when I'm in pain or why I mm. greet people in the morning. It's just, it's just an expression of something. Um, I, f I feel sad. That's why I'm praying. Mm. So it's not about trying. It's not a superstitious belief, a belief in a causal influence. It's a religious belief because it's just saying, why shouldn't the Virgin Mary weep for the sins of the world kind of response? Mm. Um, it's interesting to think of it as like an emotional response. I mean, for, for me, I've always thought of it more as a uh, attempt at psychological reassurance, effectively, or a, a, an expression of a hope that you're going to fall on the right side of fortune, effectively. Yes. Like, no, even if you know subconsciously that it's not going to have any effect. And I don't doubt that some people do genuinely think it will have an effect. Yes. Um but I think for a lot of people, it's just a sort of outpouring of expression of hoping they will end up on the right side of fortune in whatever it is they're praying for. And and the sort of self-reassurance that they think they're sort of an outlet for their, their despair or whatever it is that they're, they're seeking to get from it. So I've often heard, so there's a couple of things to pick up there. So I've often heard this response from some students who are skeptical about religion. And they'll say things like, um, but you can explain religion psychologically, right? There's a psychological evolutionary explanation for religion, to which I respond, yes, there's a psychological evolutionary ex explanation for psychology too. Does that mean we should stop doing that? <laughs> so it doesn't, it doesn't separate it from any other thing that we do. Mm. Um, the other thing to say to that is, yeah, absolutely. And, it, and probably the vast majority of people who pray think that they do it because it has an, a causal influence. 
But thinking doesn't necessarily give you the authority over what you, your belief is. Wittgenstein would still say you can think wrongly why you do something for another reason. Mm. So the, the, the thing to turn to here, actually quite interesting, is, is the book of Job. G.K. Chesterton, another Cambridge boy, obviously, um, wrote about the book of Job, which is a, you know, a beautiful text. Victor Hugo says it's the, the greatest book ever written. Um, I would agree with that up to one point, which is the bit where it turns it into a bet, where it's a bet between God and the devil. That, for me, kind of ruins the story a little bit. Mm. Um, it also ruined it for Wittgenstein. He talks about Pilgrim's Progress, Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress, where he says, if it was a test, then it's horrible. But if it's just a story, then it's fine. Mm. It's actually beautiful. Um, but anyway, so focusing on the end of the book, of Job, where Job gets to ask God, why have you done this to me? And instead of getting answers from God, he gets more questions from God. He gets riddles. And G.K. Chesterton puts it this way. He says, the riddles of God are more satisfying than the solutions of man. And what he means by that is when Job's consolers, the characters called the consolers, come to him and say, it's because you didn't do this. It's because of this, or it's because of this. Even if they said God doesn't exist, it's just, you know, it's just chance. It's just a bad luck that wouldn't have made him feel any better. Mm. <laughs> the point is that God does make him feel better. And here's the key point for me, where G.K. Chesterton says, what stops this being merely philosophical is that Job is consoled. Now, my point is this, that Wittgenstein, like G.K. Chesterton, recognised that there is this possibility of being consoled by God. I have to recognise that possibility because I can't say it's logically impossible that he was consoled by these questions. So I have to recognise the possibility of it but I am not consoled, just mm. as Wittgenstein was not consoled. So we are merely philosophical. We aren't religious, which is maybe appropriate because we're philosophers, not religious figures. But yeah, I think that's that's the distinction that he would want to draw. Yeah. And going back to the language side of things, I always had this impression that Wittgenstein's sort of, um, his position on language influenced later 20th century philosophy quite a lot, especially the, sort of the postmodernist philosophy. Is that true, and or to what extent was his influence um, sort of propagated across the twentieth century, and how did that develop into the the later twentieth century philosophers? So I'm no expert on this, but I know for a fact that Lyotard, who is largely responsible for generating this called sort of the postmodern movement, does call out Wittgenstein as one of his inspirations, and he does it on the basis of this idea of language games. So the later Wittgenstein's generation of this idea of language games, where if you're playing the religious language game, then you were by by certain rules. If you're playing the scientific language game, then you abide by other rules. If you're playing the superstitious language game, then it's probably because you're trying to do science, but you're actually doing religion or vice versa, or basically you're caught in the middle and you're doing both wrong. Mm. <laughs> so there are certain games where you can say you're just playing a game badly, and that's that might be fine. You know, we're all superstitious, even scientists are superstitious. Right? The, I often get the line, one day science will have explained everything, which is, <laughs> if anything, not a scientific belief. It's got yeah, to be yeah, a quite. superstitious one. Um, so, yeah, so this postmodern movement, this idea that you could sort of take a concept like talking about sport, for instance, take sport and sort of say, well, what could we imagine it doing in the modern era? And so postmodern would be sort of looking back on that and saying, well, this game was played this way. How can we play with it? How can we merge it with something else? And Leotard actually talks about picking up games and merging them together. And basically it provided the impetus or the, at least the language or the conceptual apparatus for thinking about how you might play with this. But John Venn right, might be given just as much credit for this because I use Venn diagrams whenever I'm trying to represent these kinds of collisions mm. between science, religion, coming in the middle is superstition, where they overlap. Um, so Wittgenstein, I don't think, has full responsibility for this, but certainly you can see his um, the timeliness of his thinking in this movement that sort of arises just after he's finishing his writings. The more and more I read about others, though, the more and more I've, I find out about people who are overlapping in their thinking with Wittgenstein anyway. P.F. Strawson, yeah. for instance, overlaps with Wittgenstein on, on much of his thinking around free will, for instance. Um, and P.F. Strawson's a Kantian. Um, Wittgenstein is, as we were talking about before, not a Kantian. He says mm. goodbye to much of the, the thinking there. Um, so I, you could argue ordinary language philosophy, which was a misinterpretation of Wittgenstein's later work. So ordinary language philosophy that says, if you want to understand what someone means, look at the game in which those words are used. What, what, what game do they get used in? What, how are they being played with? So it is God's will. 
might look like someone is saying it is John's will, right? It is it's what John wants. It's what God wants. So it looks like you're talking about an agent who has certain desires, and then you can start asking questions about those desires. But if you actually look at when that phrase is used, it's usually used when explanations come to an end. So I was saying, mm. once you reach that bedrock, you just say, it's just God's will. And Wittgenstein, late, the early Wittgenstein said, you can call it God, fate, or the world. I don't care. It's just basically when explanations come to an end, whatever's just given with the fact of the world, that's what I'm going to call God, fate, or the world. So you could argue that, that Wittgenstein hasn't really allowed for a, for a postmodernism, but is is at least opening the doors to it by saying, you know, almost things are up for grabs. You just mm. act in a different way. You just do different things. And you can sort of take concepts and play with them and... Um, and move them out of their comfort zone and, and try them in different ways. Mm. Well, didn't he, he and Russell try to, um, to get around the language problem by using lo uh, logical symbolism um, later on? And I, mean, I was reading that Wittgenstein sort of said to Russell, you, you don't understand this. And he's trying to explain out all the different logical sort of progression of his arguments and it being so complex that even someone like Russell couldn't understand it. Like, so, so what made him sort of stop that? Or did he stop? going down that route of logical symbolism as an argument argument and or did he progress beyond that later on in his his career so for Wittgenstein we were talking about that kind of where, where explanations come to an end for for Wittgenstein language uh, sorry uh, action trumps language language trumps logic it it was more like that it was more a prioritization of action over everything else so he mm. quotes goethe for instance saying in the beginning was the deed so he would say, for instance, um, free will is perfectly logically compatible with determinism. No problem. We can talk about free will and we can talk about determinism because causation does not imply compulsion. Yeah. Someone only loses free will if they're compelled to act. Well, does nature compel me to act? No, it just causes me to act. So those two things, perfectly logically compatible. No problem. But, he says, if we start talking about scientific explanations, we will simply stop talking about people's responsibility. So he gives the example of an apple tree blowing in the wind and says, in the past, people might have said, uh, look at the leaves and how they dance. Now we'd say, if only I knew the velocity of the wind and the elasticity of the leaves, then I could predict exactly how they would move. Mm. And Wittgenstein says, that's just different ways of acting. You're walking up a hill, you stop walking up a hill. Those are just different, you can do either. So we could go back to talking about the leaves dancing. That's not backtracking. It's not, it's not a devolution. It's not a, a shame that we've lost it. It's just that's what we're doing instead. So free will, if we stop talking about it, is just because we've started talking about something else, namely causation. So it's the same way in which the introduction of showers have stopped us taking baths. But it's not that showers contradict baths. Mm. So that's the level at which logic operates, right? Logic allows for possibility. Action actually confirms which possibilities we're going to manifest into reality. The, the deed is what determines the truth, as it were, or at least what's meaningful. Right. Mm. So it's truthful to say we can, you know, he acted freely, even in an age when we've stopped talking about freedom and responsibility and decision making and so forth. We can still talk about freedom, and it be and it be truthful and potentially meaningful, but it would only be meaningful if it fits into a form of life. Mm. So this is where Bertrand Russell loses Wittgenstein basically, because mm -hmm. uh, just as Russell didn't like Frege because Frege introduced this notion of sense and said that some meaning is up for grabs, that some of what words mean is got to be determined by context, by the way in which we live, etc. Russell wanted a robust understanding of reality. So he wanted it to be brought down to logic first and foremost. Logic has to be the root of it all. But Wittgenstein started there and ended very much with logic being a kind of secondary thing. To, I mentioned G.K. Chesterton early. G.K. GK Chesterton, uh, a lovely quote from him is, you can, only, um, you can only find truth with logic if you've already found it without it. <laughs> logic is a tool for confirming one's beliefs, mm. not establishing one's beliefs. It's a little bit like the Monty Python joke about uh, the Pope. 
the Pope does not have infallibility because he can't tell you which books to read. He can only tell you which books not to read. <laughs> I like that line. That's, that's kind of what logic does. Yeah. Well, again, well, logic sort of goes hand in hand with causation, doesn't it? That you can only take it so far until you reach a point of uncertainty. And then you have to either acknowledge the, the uncertainty at that point or appeal to something that is illogical, effectively, yeah. or unknown. And this happens even within sort of theoretical physics as well, doesn't it? And, and, and all these areas. And, then, and going back to the sort of the free will part of it, I think there's, as you say, incre with increasing sort of knowledge about scientific um, causation, especially in the neurological field, mm -hmm. this idea of a sort of a, a singular free will that exists outside of the realm of causality is being increasingly challenged. Mm -hmm. um, and as far as I can, I can see, it's coming down to whether or not you think people should be responsible for the sum total of causalities that influence them, even if they're not responsible for those causalities and they're outside of them. Um, and I see the sort of the forefront of this as being the diminished responsibility debates mm -hmm. around sort of uh, psychological disorders and personality disorders. So, first of all, did sort of Wittgenstein have anything to contribute to that in terms of the free will side? And how do you see that progressing philosophically as a as an argument? So Wittgenstein, as I said, mirrors P.F. Strawson on this, and P.F. Strawson's come very much into the sort of philosophical debates once again. So he, it, he probably the most important paper written on free will was his Freedom and Resentment paper. Um, his son, actually, interestingly, is very much on the side of we shouldn't have responsibility. P.F. Strawson was defending responsibility. I wonder how their family barbecues went. <laughs> but um, P.F. Strawson uh, argues that precisely because people can lack free will on the basis of a psychological disorder or etc means that we must have a notion of free will that, that exists for that you can't have your cake and eat it you can't claim everyone has a psychological disorder and maintain that some people have psychological disorders of a different type so ultimately we either all have this this issue or we don't all have this issue mm. um and Pierce Strawson's position on it was this, that precisely because there are thousands of different reasons why someone can have their responsibility removed, there can't be one reason. Mm. Precisely because if, if, the minute there's more than one reason why you can remove someone's responsibility, there can't be one reason. Yeah, well, it's, a, it's a spectrum effectively, isn't it? This is where the personality disorder thing comes in, that what suddenly counts as a personality disorder. You could get psychopaths saying, oh, it's, it's not me, it's my brain kind of mm -hmm. argument, which is a deeply philosophical point, really, isn't it? <laughs> I think it was uh, Chris Morris did a joke in his radio show On The Hour where he says uh, someone's DNA has been imprisoned in a special cell. I think he only did the joke because he could get that little pun in the end there. <laughs> um, but the idea being that, yeah, I could, I, he's free to go, but his DNA has got to go to prison. <laughs> that kind of joke. And that, that absurdity does mm. highlight the very fact that you know, we're, we're either dealing with concepts that no longer have an application. And actually, it's probably nothing to do with science and much more to do with the fact that we've lost religion. Right? So doing wrong kind of is related to sin. Good and evil are more religious notions than they are moral notions. Certainly they arrived from that particular root. You could argue actually Plato invented most of this stuff. But the idea of perpetual punishment for something you've done wrong, that's, that's definitely a religious notion. Whereas mm. temporary punishment, we're fine with. And why would we have an issue with that, right? So I don't think my dog has free will and, and has responsibility in that sense. But I'm still going to tell her off if I see her weeing on the carpet. Mm. But if she were to wee on the carpet and I not see it and then I come in two hours later and find it, I can't tell her off because it won't be effective. Mm. So again, it's, it's a punishment of a different type. So I guess my, my point here is simply to say um, that these are deeds, right? These are actions that we perform. And sure, we can give up any of them. And Wittgenstein's got it, you know, he's perfectly free and willing to say, <laughs> I shouldn't say that, should I? Free and willing. <laughs> um, he's perfectly open to the idea that we will stop talking about free will. It's absolutely fine. It's, a, it's an area of our language that could just vanish, just like religion could vanish, just like celebrating the terrible right? and co concepts which you don't really hear of at mm. all these days, celebrating terrible events. Um, we don't see that anymore. So that's gone from our from our vocabulary. We could easily lose all these sorts of things. I'm actually quite interested in when I find these kind of uh, these examples of so audio books and and text generally are these wonderful time capsules for little bits, turns of phrases that you just don't see anymore. So put the other side on. What right? does that mean? It, it, millennials. 
which I am arguably a millennial, but I'm at the bottom end of the millennials. I understand what that means. Means change the channel. All oh, right. Of yeah. the TV because we used yeah, to have right. five channels. Yeah, yeah. So put the other side on. We, we probably goes dates back to when when there were just two channels. Put the other side mm -hmm. on, meaning there's two sides to watch, and that's it. We don't say that anymore. So that is a as a turn of phrase that's vanished. Um, are you going to hear the wireless? Was something people used to say about the radio. We wouldn't say hear. We'd say listen. And it's just those little things yeah. that go out of language. We're perfectly fine with them passing by. We don't mind them passing by. I, I like the idea that we would preserve them in some way, but we don't want to hold on to them in that precious way. Is free will just a very big example of that? And that eventually we're eroding little bits of turns of phrase where we talk about this, and then eventually we'll get rid of it. Mm. But for me, the big debate around responsibility and things like this comes down to guilt. And actually talking of books, and I'm, I'm thinking specific, specifically of Agatha Christie here, she's, she's wonderful with these kinds of little turns of phrases and things, but she wrote Curtain, the last po Poirot novel. And in that, there's an example where he says, what is guilt though? And he gives the example of the Calabar tribe who have this thing called the Calabar bean. This is historically and, and realistically accurate. This does actually exist. Where they would give someone a bean if they thought they were a witch or were guilty of a certain crime. And if they died, they were guilty. And if they live, they throw up the bean, they're innocent. So like like our witch trial, but actually fair. Yeah. <laughs> if you survive, you are innocent. That's that's nice. That's right. the least you can get out of it. Um, now, what they ask in this this uh, text is, um, what is the bean measure? What is the bean measuring the calabar bean? And if the, and Hastings, being Hastings, says, oh, it's the feeling of guilt. So, but what about all those people who would kill people and not feel guilty about it? So sociopaths, psychopaths, or just people who feel justified in killing this horrible person that they, they deserve to die, right? Um, and the other thing that's suggested, of course, is some sort of magical sin, right? And this is where those anachronisms come in, right? Is it Catholic sin? When I commit a wrong act, there's some sort of dust, like in His Dark Material, sort of in here in my person and mark me out. So I gain a property, like my height, mm. my weight, etc. I've got a, a physical property or a, or a mental property of guilt. And that's how it... I don't like either of those two options. So I'm left with P.F. Strawson's option, which is guilt is being found guilty. Mm. And I'm not happy about it. I'm deeply uncomfortable. I find that deeply uncomfortable. But that for me is the only option that doesn't lead to metaphysical baggage yeah. of having to explain sin or having to explain, you know, kind of um, Catholic notions of, of responsibility and sin in that sense, which is a, a plausible option and a very easy option to take, but one that I would need to see a philosophical argument for. Yeah. So I'm left with this idea that we are guilty if we're found guilty. Mm. Well, that's practical implications as well, doesn't it? Like we've decided that the sort of the, uh, being put in front of a jury of your peers and being found innocent or guilty is the final determinant of the truth, effectively. And I think everyone acknowledges that there's still a remaining possibility in that of it not being correct mm -hmm. in terms of what actually happened, but that is the sort of the final arbiter of truth. And, and that, it's, it's a macrocosm right, of, of so many philosophical debates. The philosophers want to look for the truth. So they take this macrocosm and they say, well, you know, obviously the guilt is obviously pointing to something that's true, right? Justice is a, um, uh, a facsimile or a, a kind of an attempt to reach a truthful verdict, um, meaning that there must be some sort of truth about it. But maybe there isn't. Maybe there isn't a truth. Maybe it's just this determinant that gets you there. So philosophy of sport is a really useful way of bringing this in because you can ask questions like, did Maradona cheat? To which every British person I've ever asked will obviously say, yes, he did. To which I have to respond, technically he didn't. Because if the ref doesn't see it, it's not cheating. Because yeah. that's in the rule book. These days, the ref includes a lot more than just the bloke <laughs> on the pitch, doesn't it? That's the thing. It does. And my, my question is this... So the introduction of Hawkeye, the introduction of video referees, which we're getting more and more examples of, um, does this increase in accuracy increase fairness? And my argument is it doesn't. So a half-blind referee is half-blind for both teams. A biased referee absolutely is unjust. We should mm. get rid of a, a biased referee. But a half-blind referee, I have no problem with because he, he would make wrong calls for both sides. So it's fine. So... It's not it's it's not unfair, it's just inaccurate. Yeah. Again, I'm not okay, comfortable so with that answer. Yeah, right. Okay. So you're <laughs> saying it's 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 more true, but it's not any more fair, effectively, to have accurate replays of ever, of exactly what happened. Because it applies equally to both sides. There's no increase in fairness. 
because they were, they were sort of gone from half accurate, say, to fully accurate or, re- or close to fully accurate. Mm-hmm. So the fairness hasn't increased, but the I suppose the justice is increased, you could say. Only if you assume there is a truth, right? You have to assume that there is a holy rule book yeah. out there in the ether, a perfect rule book, just as Plato imagined the forms of the perfect chair, for instance. We have to imagine there's a perfect rule book and that's what they're really playing to. And the real rule book is kind of a, you know, a, par- a parallel to that, an imperfect model of that perfect rule. But my view is that we've only got the rule book. And if the rule book says the referee, who is a human being, makes an incorrect judgment. By the way, I can't really complain about this either, because if someone changes the rule book, mm-hmm. I've got nowhere to go. So all I can say is, yeah, he either cheated. But back then, I can use a historical case and say Maradona did not cheat. He is a cheater. That's a different point, right? He is a cheater because he is the kind of person who has this pr- property of himself, who has the propensity to cheat. But he did not cheat. That act was not an act of cheating in the game of football as mm. it was played then. Yeah. I oh, could you make the argument though that if you're if you're increasing the accuracy of the decision making, um, then you're reducing the probability of any bias the ref does have of having an, in- an influence on the game. So if the ref, say the ref makes, I don't know, 10 decisions across the game, five for one team, five for the other team, and, and they happen to go 6-4 instead of 5-5 five, five or 6-4 the other way, that the, the increase in accuracy is going to make it more likely that you get an equal balance of decision making just through the number of sort of iterative decisions that are made across a game, even if the ref isn't biased. Absolutely. So this is the best argument I've heard for this particular case, although I've never heard it made by anyone in sports. <laughs> um, but certainly from philosophy well, students... Well, they, they don't want to admit that there might yourself. be a possibility that refs are biased in any way, would they? No, no, exactly that. So they take an almost idealistic view, which as a philosopher, I also want to take. So I want to say, but I can believe that a, a ref won't be biased. But then, of course, we're much more open to the idea now of unconscious bias. So if I get two applications from students, for instance, for a particular course, and one of them's called something Smith and one of them's called something Muhammad, do I view those those differently? I absolutely, by the way, I just want to very make very clear, <laughs> I would not have any bias to either of those students. I would look at them dispassionately and make a verdict on which one is the best candidate or hopefully give them both a place in the course. Um, but when it comes to uh, sort of biases that I'm not even aware of, that might come into thing, you know, might come into mm. play. So uh, how could I avoid that? There's nothing I can do to mm. avoid that. So that's another good argument for why you should have video referees and Hawkeye and things like that, because they can't be biased. But we've also seen that technology can be biased because it's made by people who, for instance, Facebook, when they were designing their face recognition mm-hmm. systems, took photos of people in the office. The people in the office were either Asian or white, so it was terrible at recognizing black faces, which meant, hugely inaccurate results from that mm. that happening. Well, Equal- you'd, you'd struggle to find an example of that in sport, though, wouldn't you? Because normally it's neutral things like balls and, and lines and things that you're examining. You'd hope so, yeah, ex- absolutely. So you could make a very strong case for this for them being introduced. Although, I, again, as I say, I've never heard that case being made by the people who want to introduce Hawkeye, etc. And to be honest, the other side of the debate would be it ruins the game. Now, I went to my very first rugby game not that long ago, um, and I, I don't. I'm not. I'm not actually a sportsman. I don't actually like sport, and I used to wind up my brother <laughs> by talking about you know, how the fact that philosophy of sport without actually being a sports fan. Absolutely, I love the philosophy of sport because it's a way, a beautiful way into talking about gender equality and all these kind of things, and fairness and accuracy and the rules of a game, for instance, which of course is a Wittgensteinian. I'm, I'm interested in, but in terms of the actual sports, I used to wind up my brother, who's an Everton fan saying if Liverpool sold all their players to Everton and vice versa, Everton switched players there and then they switched kits and then they switched grounds because they're not that far apart, right? So they can switch (laughs) grounds. And then they switched, you know, uh, managers and coaches and all these kinds of things. Who would you support? To which his answer was Everton. So I said, you follow the name then. I just, I, by eroding that, and I realised I was a horrible brother and that was a mean thing <laughs> well, to do. Well, it's tribal but. identity, isn't it? It's not It's not the, the content of the of the team or the, even the location or anything like that, to, well, to, to some degree, but it's the, the branding of the of the tribe, effectively, that you're, you're ascribing to. But the interesting thing is we do it with sport, we don't do it with other things. So I don't cheer, for instance, in my office when I found out that Coca-Cola's stock has gone up because I like Coca-Cola more than Pepsi, <laughs> for instance. So I go, yeah, Coca-Cola, yeah, hooray. I don't, by the way, I don't do any of those things. But but if I were to if I were to do that, people would think it was odd. And I was just suggesting that once you've got money in the game, once it becomes a company-led 
initiative that you've kind of if you were to switch all the players all the sort of the the stuff that is the game who are you really supporting is it just a corporate identity and that kind of thing and mm. that that for me was the the bigger issue or the reason i was winding my brother up but it was also the reason why i couldn't buy into it i couldn't you know again it was like i'm merely philosophical i'm not religious <laughs> about sport so i was stuck in that kind of merely philosophical position well, maybe you need to increase your philosophical perspective. You need to get to be more tribal and more committed to a single team. And then you'll be able to have more insights into why you're rooting for certain people and not others. Well, this be brings us beautifully into another topic which I talk about uh, here at ICE, which is post-truth. Um, which uh, also brings up this, this issue of uh, who are you really supporting and, and why do you support them and those sorts of things. And to the point where, so I've talked with people who are conservatives and who, people who are liberal, and I try, I'm genuinely trying to be impartial in this discussion because I want to be the philosopher in the room. So I say things like, but what interests me is the fact that it seems like the liberals have rationality, humor, and uh, morality on their side, just because I can offer more justifications that are rational, moral, or political for why we should do the things that they want to do. So Brexit, for instance, has been frustrated by this reality of the fact that, that it's coming up against uh, the, the inability to actually find justification. So even Boris Johnson defending it says things like, we'll still be able to buy kippers. Well, I can buy kippers now. Right? So it's not something new that we're gaining. It's just something that we're supposed to not be losing. And again, it's, so it's mm. hard to be justifying this position. And what I realized was conservatives seem to lack this. And when I try to think of what a conservative comedian, for instance, so we're, we're in this kind of post-satire era where even liberal comedians now just tell the news. They just say, this is what happened today. And mm. people laugh. And so it, we're in this difficult position where satire is not really getting a grip of the real politics that's going on. Um, but com like conservative comedians can't really get a grip on this either. And they, they almost have nowhere to go with this because liberals can poke fun at conservatives, but conservatives can't poke fun at liberals. But much more importantly, liberals can poke is fun at true? liberals. I, well, have you seen? Did you see the recent Dave Chappelle Netflix special? Okay, go on. That's so. There's been a lot of talk online about this. So Dave Chappelle is a American black American comedian. Yeah. Um, he did a Netflix special very recently, and it's completely politically incorrect. Like, make loads and loads of joke, like semi-racist, semi-sexist jokes. Not in like a malicious way, yep. but in a in a sort of semi-taboo these days way. Um, and the sort of the, the the establishment critics gave it 0% initially on Rotten Tomatoes. Right. And then as soon as they put up the um, the audience score, the audience gave it 99% right. score. And there's, and I think, and then you see, I mean, you see people like um, uh, Jeff Norcott, the conservative comedian as well. Yes. And there's, there, I think there was a few more conservative comedians at there, Edinburgh this there. year. And there's almost, I think, like, the more I look at all, all these things, I think they're all sort of fluctuating one way to the other in almost everything. And I think we've almost gone so far, like you say, that the 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 satirical organizations cannot make satire anymore because reality is so ridiculous mm -hmm. that the, the comedy has almost shifted back around to make fun of the fact that reality is so ridiculous um, in reference to more, I guess, small C conservative roots. Yeah. So the two things to say, that, so yes, absolutely, conservatives can make fun of liberals, but they make fun of liberals in the same way that liberals make fun of liberals. So the, you know the kind of the the cuck kind of uh, mm. the, the, those kinds of comments yeah, yeah. and the the snowflakes and those kinds of things, which I see banded about by both sides, etc. But what tends not to happen is that conservatives don't criticise themselves in the same way that liberals criticise conservatives. Does that make sense? So conservatives mm. criticise yeah. liberals in the same way that liberals criticise liberals, but liberals don't uh, criticise. Conservatives don't criticise conservatives in the same way that liberals can criticise conservatives. And until you see that, there won't be a parity on that level. But you're right. But I think th that there are conservative comedians out there and they are doing the things that I'm talking about. But, and, and I also want to stress, I would love to see more of them for reasons I'll come to in a moment. But it's about 97 to 3, right? In terms of liberal TV. I mean, we talk yeah. about the, in America. Well, in most about the media, media things, really, isn't it? Yeah, most media-related organisations are predominantly left-wing dominated. So it was amazing to me when I looked at the spread, left-wing to right-wing, of different medias across different countries. Right. So in America, they're absolutely right. There is a left-wing media. It's way out to the left, and then Fox News, this huge circle, way out to the right. So you get these huge polar extremes. Mm. In Britain, though, interestingly, it's mostly clustered around the centre. Equally, in Germany and other countries as well, clustered around the centre. 
Um, but in America, definitely left-wing media probably is a trick. And I, I used to think that was just something conservatives threw out incorrectly, but there are a lot of liberal media forms out, out mm. in America. Um, you know, facing off against essentially Fox News and Breitbart and that's it. Um, but what I, what I was getting at with this was simply to say, I, there's no outlet for a kind of conservative political um, mandate except power. Um, now, that's not, that sounds like a criticism. It's not entirely a criticism. It's simply to say, if you don't, if you can't fall back on reason, by the way, I'm not the one of those people who thinks you have to be able to fall back on reason on every single thing you do. As I said, explanations come to an end somewhere. So ultimately, every rational explanation has to finish at, it just is. Wittgenstein used to say, it's just there like our life. It's just, mm. it's just a given. It's just, you know, ultimately, ultimately you just say, it's God's will, right? It's just there. Um, but conservatives go there much sooner simply because there's there's no real route to justification because they know that they'll end up having to water down the position to another position. So instead, you force it through. You push it through. You use what Derrida would call violence, i.e. a kind of sublimation, you know, a subsumation of the, the other by your particular viewpoint. So I try and encompass your view or push your view out of, out of the picture. Now, again, that's not a criticism. That's hopefully just an analysis of what I see going on. Now, I, therefore, I think if anyone, if the liberals, if liberal people wanted to actually see conservatives challenged, what they should be doing is trying to find conservative pun, you know, people who can offer argument, who can offer um, comedy. It's notable that the comedy in particular is so low, uh, mm. you know, in, so disparate. Um, so it, if, to the point where I've even considered trying to become a conservative comedian myself and actually come up with jokes that actually poke fun of conservatives in the same way that liberals poke some fun of conservatives, but for a conservative audience. Mm. Now, I think it, give it a go yourselves, right? And it, you'll find yeah. out how difficult well, it I think is. But people like Jeff Norcott do do that, I think. And there is there is sort of some fringe element of doing that. And more comedians are finding that that is a sort of an open niche in the right. market, effectively, I suppose, given that it's well, all power to them. <laughs> But I think I think the, the the more I think about this, the more I think that the, the traditional sort of left right divide is less relevant now than the the sort of libertarian authoritarian um, uh, axis. Effectively, yeah. The, the 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 key differences are, exist in the degree to which you believe that the state should have power or the individual should have power, um, and that's sort of hidden away and behind this traditional left right. Where, where do you sit in the French Parliament, whatever it was? Um, division and and that there's almost it's it's urging to get out that that shift and we need to or in the entire political spectrum in 90 degrees to say that left right are not no longer the primary relevant axes and it is now about authoritarianism versus libertarianism it's interesting for instance and this is this is going to tell you a lot about the kinds of things that i'm interested in sadly <laughs> um which is that people have started defending the emperor in star wars <laughs> that's not that's not that's not intended as a joke that is some it's, 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 um, i mean i think wittgenstein would have been interested in this if he was alive today or maybe he would have run for the hills but he would have been interested in the i i think in the in the sort of uh the, the cultural fact that people are saying you know what darth vader and the emperor kind of they did want peace and they kind of got it you know wasn't it the rebels who caused all the problems it was a well-ordered well-run machine kind of thing mm. and to the point where so these bad guys of the 80s these are the kind of really obvious they're the bad guys now today we're kind of like well maybe it's a bit more nuanced and we've got kind of talk about you know the graying areas and those kinds of things and people saying well maybe you know give give the emperor a break right give him a chance <laughs> And that's really, for me, that's really yeah. telling. The fact that people can start saying that about cultural Well, the, the current sort of topical justification or equivalent to this is the China-Hong Kong debate. And you, I've been absolutely... Thank you for raising yeah. the tone. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've been fascinated to see how, how reluctant some people on the left are to defend democratic protests. And they're, even some are going to the extent of backing China yeah. and the, backing the, sort of the authoritarian Chinese side. Um, against people who are protesting legally or illegally for democracy, and I think it's it's like you, like you say you're sort of justifying the um, defending of the emperor in Star Wars, which you could easily make an analogy to the to the Chinese government and the, and the CCP in that. Yeah, and it's it's all, like to me as someone who's more on the libertarian side, definitely it's it's kind of terrifying that people are starting to make those sort of justifications. 
So yeah, less so in America. So things like, I, again, this is based on my picking up of things from American media that they, they will back the Hong Kong protests no matter what. Um, certainly on, on the left, it, it's just they mm. are the good guys um, because they're protesting and they're protesting for democracy. Um, yeah, so uh, I, I, I think we should probably wrap this up soon. But I, I, yeah, I think sure. um, when it comes to the, the, the political situations we're seeing, the populism, for instance, who can argue against populism, right? It seems mm. like... Th that, well, it's, it's synonymous in, with democracy, surely. Indeed. Um, and it was interesting seeing a debate where we had the SNP, the Brexit Party, um, and, and the other main parties sitting in a room. And I saw them being posed this question. It was Politics Live, I think. And the SNP didn't recognise that they were a, a nationalist movement. And the Brexit party didn't recognise that they were populist. They looked at Europe and said, oh, it's a terrifying thing that's happening over there. We're best out of it. And it's like, we're actually in that. If you, if you think that's terrifying, you are that here. Mm. It, was it was like a lack of self-awareness around what the political movements on each side were about. Now, again, I'm not criticising any particular party on that. I'm simply saying... I think every party has a lack of self-awareness, but there was a certain clear lack of self-awareness around the, the division that they set up then between the UK. If we're doing it, it's fine. If the continent are doing it, it's bad. Mm. And so it's, again, it's like with Hong well, it's Kong. It's the tribal thing, isn't it? Like the Everton, the football teams, if, you're, if your team is doing it, it doesn't matter. And if the other team's doing it, it's the worst thing in the world. But it's like we're playing across 15 different lines. 15 mm. different um, you know, uh, divisions. So I, we've got the UK continental division, we've got the right wing, left wing division, we've got the populist versus nationalist versus uh, you know, democratic versus royalist versus loyalist versus <laughs> unionist versus uh, globalist and mm. all these kinds of positions. It's interesting, so very quickly just to end on, on this um, topic, which I've, I've been thinking about a lot, is that if you wanted to be a globalist, what's the best route there? Is it appealing to unity? Because I remember being asked this question when I was um, when we were going through the referendum: Do you feel British or European? And of course, the answer is I'm both. That's a false dichotomy. But the the, the assumption there was something like: You're in a united kingdom, so you have a union already. Do you want to be united in a union with which, again, you're united already? It's like, who are you feeling united with? Technically, I'm already on both sides. It's not quite like the Everton-Liverpool thing. I'm already playing for both teams. Mm. Who am I united with? So then it was a case of so appealing to greater union is an impossibility when you're looking to create globalism because, of course, many people pointed out the EU is a select club. It's the oldest, part, oldest and richest part of the world. Well, it's, you know, globally, you know, in yeah. terms of civilization, in terms of politics and, and that kind of thing. So... Isn't this a closed group? Shouldn't we be looking to Bangladesh? Shouldn't we be looking to Australia and, and South America and all these places? You know, the world is bigger than Europe. So that's not greater union. Mm. So that objection can only be raised precisely because we're not looking at it in the right way. So if, you're a P if you want globalization, I actually would argue that what you should be looking for is l ever lesser union, ever greater devolution. Because ultimately, yeah. once you get down from continents to countries to uh, regions to localities to families to individuals then you suddenly realize that everyone every single person on the planet is on the same level yeah. we are all individuals that's the libertarian approach yeah, right? it's just, ultimately it's down to individual. so that should be the appeal to getting a global mm. picture is division actually trumps unity yeah well i think i found it interesting that more and more people are making the distinction between internationalism and globalism well, a lot of people who are, say, are sort of have been using the globalism tag as a as a negative, effectively, mm -hmm. saying I'm not a globalist, I'm an internationalist, and saying I'm open to the world and becoming a sort of global trading nation, but yeah. not a global integrationalist approach. I believe in the inter the interaction of nations, internationalism, rather than globalism as a whole. Yes. But then, were you to have a I don't know an alien invasion, suddenly everybody <laughs> would be a globalist, and be like we the totality of the globe will be fighting this other entity thing that's outside of that. And that exists on every sort of scale, doesn't it? Right the way down to the individual. So best solution for Brexit is alien invasion. Alien invasion. <laughs> I think we should end there. On that note, <laughs> yeah. thank you. Alex, thank you very much. Thank you.